Cities in space? Cities on the moon? If you clicked on this, you're probably a little more than skeptical that NASA is going to be capable of doing any of these things. Number one, because they don't have the budget, and number two, perhaps because they don't have the competence. However, NASA themselves actually realize this, and they're not going to try to do any of these things themselves, but rather to encourage the private sector to do it by applying seed money to these concepts. And this is why the NASA Innovative Technology Concept Studies Awards were created, otherwise known as NIAC. And this year, actually January of 2025, a number of very intriguing concepts were funded by NASA, one of which you're watching right now. And interestingly enough, the mainstream media didn't report on this at all. Only space-oriented news agencies had anything to say about these incredible concepts that NASA is attempting to support. Perhaps because the media only wants you to pay attention to things like politics right now, which in my opinion is just going to put you into an early grave. A total of 15 concepts were approved for funding, but two really stood out as far as I'm concerned, and those are in regards to constructing new habitats for the human species, both in orbit and on the moon. The first is Construction Assembly Destination by Think Orbital Incorporated, and the second is Lunar Glass Structure, also known as Lungs, enabling construction of monolithic habitats in low-gravity environment from Skyports LLC. And even though the mainstream media may not think that these projects are particularly interesting, we're going to cover both of them in as much detail as we can right here on The Angry Astronaut right now. Okay, folks, we are finally here at Space Symposium. And once again, as many of you can probably anticipate, I have tracked down British representatives here at Space Symposium. Of course, they're going to put themselves everywhere to make sure everybody knows what Britain is doing in spaceflight. And of course, for those of you familiar with my work, you know that Goon Hilly has always been a big name. Goon Hilly providing vital tracking services, vital communication for NASA and for just about everybody else. Let's go ahead and talk about NASA and IAC. All right, so first of all, we need to talk about Skyports here, a name that you're probably not all that familiar with because I wasn't either, to be honest, but I'll tell you, their concepts of building a very large facility, a large habitation structure on the moon is both unique and, in my opinion, very feasible, simply because of the use of in situ resources. They're taking this to an entirely different level, making use of the most common substance in the lunar regolith, and that, of course, is silicon in order to blow massive glass structures on the moon. But instead of just telling you about this we need to show you what they're doing so go ahead and we'll let skyports take it from here At some point in the future, humanity will need somewhere to live on the moon. While aesthetics may not be the primary consideration when deciding what kind of habitat to build, it sure doesn't hurt. The more pleasing the look of the habitat, the better, but ultimately, the functionality will determine whether or not it will be built. Dr. Martin Bermudez thinks that he's found a sweet synergy that was both functional and aesthetically pleasing with his design for a spherical lunar lunar habitat made out of blown glass. NASA apparently agrees there's potential there, as he recently received an NIAC Phase 1 grant to flesh out the concept further. His vision's artistic design looks like something out of an Arthur C. Clarke novel, a glass sphere rising off the lunar surface that could potentially contain living and work areas for dozens of people, 
His firm, Skyports, is founded on creating these blown glass structures in space and especially on the moon. This innovative concept involves in situ melting of lunar glass compounds. And keep in mind, there's plenty of materials for glass in the lunar regolith. The surface of the moon is practically made out of silicon. Traditional construction methods, such as using prefabricated parts, 3D printing, inflatable systems, and complex assembly are labor-intensive and time-consuming. In contrast, the concept of blown, scalable glass structures utilizes lunar glass resources and introduces a novel in-situ manufacturing approach. They propose utilizing existing microwave oven melting technology to melt lunar glass that will be collected from the lunar surface. Additionally, they will develop a smart microwave furnace to melt and blow the glass bubble sphere. By employing techniques used in large-scale glass manufacturing, this study aims to explore the feasibility of blowing large glass structures on the lunar surface. The idea of constructing monolithic glass habitats on the moon holds immense promise for the future of space exploration and habitation. It inspires a pioneering spirit by envisioning a new era of self-sustaining off-world habitats, offering significant benefits to NASA, the aerospace community, and humanity as a whole. The glass sphere habitat design takes advantage of the structural integrity of a sphere, minimizing gravitational potential and evenly distributing pressure. This unique design choice ensures resistance to the extreme conditions of the lunar environment, including the moon's gravity and temperature variations, while providing a self-contained living space. Further study is required to assess the feasibility of this model under thermal vacuum lab conditions. The boldness of this vision is expected to capture the public's interest, which it obviously has has, it grabbed my interest anyway, igniting curiosity and support for space exploration. Moreover, this innovative approach could stimulate economic growth by fostering advancements in glass manufacturing and construction technologies, potentially leading to spin-offs and applications beyond aerospace. The concept of constructing monolithic glass habitats on the moon represents a revolutionary departure from current construction practices and holds the potential to transform the future of space exploration and habitation. By leveraging lunar resources and innovative manufacturing technologies, this approach offers a promising solution for establishing self-sustaining large-scale habitats on the lunar surface. You know what? I agree with this executive summary. This is a very interesting idea simply because it's making use of an in situ resource that's so abundant on the moon. You can find silicon, as I said before, everywhere on the moon. So if you can make use of in situ resources to build your habitats on top of harvesting the ice that's present on the moon, therefore water, breathable oxygen, rocket fuel, and also the water that you need in order to get hydroponics going, that means you can sustain a large human population on the lunar surface with minimal support from Earth, which is what NASA has been trying to achieve all along, and therefore a fantastic study for them to support under an IAC. But what about cities in space? Next up, we have Cities in Space, and this is a company that has already been doing things in orbit. They have executed the first ever automated weld in, in orbit. This has never been done in vacuum, so a huge accomplishment, and this, this took place back in 2024. Did any of you hear about this accomplishment? Do you hear anything about this from the mainstream media? I don't think so. But not only are they doing this, they want to turn this application towards building massive structures in space. We're talking about structures that are built big enough to house hundreds and hundreds of astronauts, not a half dozen. And NASA was sufficiently impressed with their proposal in order to give them an NIAC grant. So let's check them out. 
And in case you didn't believe me, here's the Falcon 9 launch that carried Think Orbital's first experiment to orbit. And according to their press release on May 17th, 2024, quote, we are thrilled to announce that we've achieved the majority of our Flight 1 objectives, marking a significant leap forward in space innovation. Our journey has been nothing short of extraordinary, from the groundbreaking first ever autonomous in-space weld to the historic return of flown in space electron beam welder samples. These samples will be meticulously analyzed by NASA and the European Space Agency, paving the way for groundbreaking discoveries. Throughout this milestone filled journey, we have one, designed and built the world's first autonomous in space welding system, two, conducted and passed rigorous vibration, shock, and thermal testing, three, garnered FAA and FCC flight authorization, that isn't easy, and number four, of course, successfully launched and landed on Falcon 9 on May 6th of 2024. This is just the beginning of our continued commitment to pushing the boundaries of possibility in space exploration. So yeah, they've managed to weld something in space, but apparently their more ambitious objectives are something that NASA regarded as being worthy of an NIAC award. I'm going to go ahead and quote from an article in Gizmodo about this topic. Quote, Think or Orbital has big plans for low Earth orbit, designing an orbital platform that could be used to manufacture products in space as well as remove and recycle space debris. The spherical structure, which was named the Think Platform, would be a free-flying, non-pressurized platform that would either operate as part of a larger commercial station or it could dock with a spacecraft like SpaceX's Starship. Now, in 2021, NASA rejected Think Orbital's commercial space station concept. Concept. Instead, they awarded $415.6 million for space station proposals from Blue Origin, NanoRax, and Northrop Grumman. And by the way, they don't even mention Sierra Space. Sierra Space is part of the Blue Origin space station, which sadly but predictably doesn't seem to have made a whole lot of progress. Only NanoRax, in conjunction with Airbus, has made a substantial amount of progress thus far on their space station concept. But all that having been said, let's go ahead and see what Lee Rosen, president of this company, had to say. Quote, this platform can be for manufacturing, human habitation, military applications, and whatnot. This is according to an interview that he gave to Space News. And the good news is we don't have to bend any physics to make it happen. In Space electron beam welding was demonstrated by the Soviets in the 80s, so we know it works. Not only was it demonstrated by the Soviets, it was just demonstrated by Think Orbital as well last year. We want to do an in-flight demo so we have the data ourselves, but we're confident that it works. Well, again, yeah. They were well justified in being confident about all that because they just did it, as I said a few months ago. Think Platform would be used to manufacture high-speed computer chips, fiber optics, or pharmaceutical products for the public and private sector, according to Rosen. The platform could also be used to send out small satellites to collect space junk floating around in orbit and either recycle it by turning it into fuel or deorbit it. Quote, we could process debris at the hub, for example, and turn aluminum aluminum into aluminum powder that could be used for spacecraft fuel. Again, another quote from Rosen. The company recently secured two research contracts worth a quarter of a million dollars under the U.S. Space Force Orbital Primes Program for in-space servicing. By the way, this article dates back to 2022. The NIAC award is far more substantial. So let's have a look at their various space station designs. We'll start out with the Think Platform 2, which is a platform for on-orbit servicing, assembly, and manufacturing provides a safe environment for servicing, refueling, in-space manufacturing. It has a diameter of 20 meters and therefore a volume of 4 thousand cubic meters, almost quadruple the volume of Starship's fairing. And by the way, if you want to go ahead and crunch some numbers, 
individual astronauts require about 25 cubic meters in order to have a comfortable habitat for them. 25 cubic meters per astronaut. So if you're talking 4,000 cubic meters, that's enough space for 160 astronauts, the population of a small town. Building a city out of several of these things would not take very many launches of SpaceX Starship. This thing is actually designed to be launched on Starship. It has a mass that matches Starship's capability. So the next version of this space station, which is the Think Platform 3, is just an upgraded version of Think Platform 2. It doesn't appear to be substantially bigger aside from its solar panel capabilities. However, given the fact that Think Orbital is actually here in Colorado Springs, and of course they're at Space Symposium, I intend to get some more details about all of this very soon, so stay tuned. And then there's Think Platform 4, which is four of these spheres is combined into a cluster with a very large solar array providing power. This has the capability of housing 640 astronauts in a single space station, a legitimate space city that could be deployed by six starship launches, perhaps seven. I'm not entirely certain about all the details, but given the fact that a starship can haul one of these spheres up at a time, you add on the solar panels and other components, I would say six or seven Starship launches should be able to do the trick. Think of how much of a difference that represents compared to the number of space shuttle launches that were required to build the International Space Station. In my opinion, NASA has made some amazing choices for NIAC this year, and I can't wait to see what they're going to do next. Impressive beyond all belief, folks. I can't wait to get more details from these companies because, after all, they're right here at Space Symposium along with everybody else. And also keep in mind, I am going to be coming back to Goon Hilly very soon in order to interview them. They've got some new staff there, new applications, new customers, all sorts of exciting business that they're bringing to the United Kingdom, demonstrating just what can be done on a very small amount of funding like so many British space launch providers and space technology providers. Can't wait to bring you all of that once again. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for all of your support in getting me here. If you would like to continue to support this endeavor, all the details are in the description. Don't forget to like and subscribe and as always, stay angry about space.